Well, hello and welcome to our webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Katie. I'll be your host and I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment. But um, the topic tonight is safe and smart exercises for diabetes. Um, should you have any technical difficulties, there is a phone number to call here at the bottom of the screen, 1-800-263-6317. So thank you so much everyone for joining us this evening. We're so happy you're with us. Um, our format includes a short presentation followed by an interactive discussion. Um, should you have a question, um, you just type it in the question section of your webinar toolbar. Um, the toolbar will probably be at the right hand side of your screen and you can drag the toolbar, ar toolbar around if you need to move it out of your way. Um, at the end, you'll have a chance to ask questions. So we look forward to an interactive webinar. We know that the information you're about to hear may motivate you to make lifestyle changes, but please consult your physician before making any changes to your current routine. The Cecilia Health Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist will provide strategies to help you manage your diabetes, but this online Q&A session is intended to give general advice. This information is not a substitute for personal medical advice and involves the professional opinion of the Cecilia Health Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. Our webinar leader this evening is Laura Ashley Johnson. Laura Ashley has been a practicing registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator for 11 years. She's from Irvine, Kentucky, but now lives in Houston, Texas. Laura has a passion for nutrition and enjoys cooking for her family. Some of her other hobbies are watching Kentucky basketball, traveling with her family, and spending time with her Norfolk ter Terrier named Butter. So thank you so much, Laura, for being with us this evening um, and sharing your expertise with us. So you may take it away now. Sounds great. Thank you so much. I'm so happy y'all are here. I know a lot of folks that I spoke with this morning. I see you on here. Lots of patients. So welcome. Like she said, we're going to be talking a lot about exercise and physical activity. And here are the specific things on our agenda for today that we're going to chat about. So we're going to talk about the benefits of physical activity and the research that supports the claims as to how much, how often, what you should be doing. We're going to talk about how much exercise is enough exercise and how to manage blood glucose as you exercise and do physical activity. Also, how to adjust insulin. And then at the end, we will definitely have time for questions and I'll give you some answers and sharing information. If you've got helpful tips that you feel like will help others, I would love to share that with them as well. But please talk with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your diabetes treatment plan after we have this discussion tonight. So let's get started. After, you know, there are many challenges, you know, there's reasons, you might say excuses, you know, whatever you want to call it, there are roadblocks to physical activity. Maybe you don't enjoy it. Maybe I get the I'm so tired. Or maybe you're tired of starting and quitting what you do as a routine. Um, some folks say they just maybe can't afford maybe going to the gym. Maybe you're not seeing those changes quick enough and the motivation's not as strong, or maybe you don't know how to do it the right way. I also get told sometimes that childcare, you know, is an issue um, or just stressed, you know, tired, sore. I'm listing a lot of things right now because I want to make sure everybody knows that we're all in this together and there's reasons why we, that things that hold us back from exercise. Um, and, you know, some of these are harder than others to overcome or to fix in order to get that physical activity incorporated. But under most circumstances, you you can, if you truly want to get exercise in, you'll be able to get it into your routine. So there are many, many mental, emotional, and physical benefits to doing regular physical activity. You know, it reduces the risk of developing or dying of, of heart disease or cardiovascular disease. It reduces blood pressure and the risk of developing hypertension. It does increase healthy cholesterol, that HDL, and it decreases the triglycerides and bad cholesterol. I always like to say, if you're ever confused of when your doctor gives you those lipids and they say HDL and LDL and 
too many L's. Just think HDL starts with H. That's the healthy one. We want it to be high. And the LDL is the bad one. We want it to be low. <laughs> but exercise also increases metabolism, which can help with the weight loss that many folks want. Regular physical activity can also strengthen bones and muscles and slow that loss of bone density, which is really important, especially for women. And it can help you rest at night, sleep better, um, decrease your stress and anxiety. And it also can help regulate and improve your blood sugars, which we talk about a lot with patients. So this is a cartoon for those folks who are not are listening on the phone. You might not be able to see it, but I'll, I'll try to explain it a little bit. So physical activity has a lot of positive effects on insulin sensitivity. That might be something that you've heard your doctor say before. It helps insulin work better. Just kind of envision sugar floating in your blood. It's in there float down and it's waiting for insulin to unlock your cells so that it can get out of the blood and inside the cells. This is what makes you feel like you have energy. It's actually energy. So when you're using your muscles more, they need more sugar too. So you have this effect of sugar coming out of the blood into the cells and muscles more because they need more sugar to be more active. So you're burning more. So exercise really, really helps to burn up that sugar. We want to get it out of the bloodstream. So this, I know sometimes clinical trials, when we say clinical trials, you think, oh, grass is going to be confusing. But this is a really, really important one that showed us a lot of um, data and information as to the effects of exercise with diabetes versus medication versus take doing neither one as well. This is called the DPP, it's the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was a major clinical trial aimed at discovering whether diet and exercise or oral diabetes drugs, the metformin particularly, could prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in people with prediabetes. So we're going to look at this together here. So in 2001 was when this happened. There were 27 clinical centers around the country that were split into random groups. And there was the lifestyle group that received intensive training and diet, exercise, and behavior modification. They were eating less fat calories and exercising 150 minutes a week. So a 5 to 7 percent, there we go, a 5 to 7 percent weight loss was recommended with these folks as well. They met with researchers 16 times in 24 weeks and then in two months with at least one phone call between visits. So these people had a lot of folks checking in on them. They had some very active changes they were making with lifestyle, exercise. They had very structured plans. Um, the second group took 850 milligrams of metformin twice a day. And then the third group took placebo pills. So the second and third group also got a little info on diet and exercise, but no intensive counseling efforts like that first group did. So in total, there were 3,234 participants that were overweight and insulin glucose intolerant. So let's take a look at what happened as a result. So here's a chart here. Some people are listening on the phone, so you might not be able to see it, but I can explain too. So versus the placebo, the incidence of diabetes with the lifestyle group showed a 58% reduction and 31% less with the metformin group. There we go. Comparing the lifestyle to metformin showed 39% reduction with lifestyle. So it was clinically proven, and this study was paramount in showing how effective lifestyle changes really are, 58%. So studies conducted over the past 15 years have noted that complications frequently found in obese patients appear to be associated with the location of excess fat rather than excess weight, specifically in that abdominal area. So the patients that have more abdominal obesity and metabolic syndrome is at a higher risk for coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, and other related mortality. They also tend to have dyslipidemia, high cholesterol in the form of high triglycerides and decreased levels of those healthy uh, cholesterols, HDLs that I spoke about earlier. So a simple and practical screening tool such as 
a measurement of the waist circumference with a tape measure can be used to assess the risk by monitoring the accumulation or loss of visceral fat between visits. There's also one that's like a pincher along the waist. It doesn't work always consistently. There are folks who get trained to do it really well, but um, measuring around the waist is more common. So along with excess abdominal fat, there are many, many cardiovascular risk factors. So one is family history. So if you have a blood relative that have cardio coronary artery disease before the age of 60, that's a higher risk. And you can't control heredity, but you can reduce risk through other ways. So one is smoking because nicotine narrows the blood vessels, causing an increase in your blood pressure and your heart rate. And carbon monoxide competes with oxygen in the red blood cell, so there's less oxygen carry to the heart. So this increases the risk of heart disease by damaging the artery wall and allowing more cholesterol to deposit on the wall. You know, smoking also reduces that healthy cholesterol, which we want to be high, and it makes blood thicker and easier to form clots. So what you can do, stop smoking. And it's just one day at a time. So you got, there's lots of plans and ways to try to quit smoking, chewing gum, asking a friend for help. There's medication that you might want to talk with your doctor about, um, support groups. There's a lot of ways that you can go about trying to to quit smoking. Hypertension is a risk factor for blood pressure. It's the amount of force on the artery wall when your heart pumps and relaxes with each heartbeat. So normal is over 120 over 80, um, 140 over 90 is hypertension. And narrowed blood vessels increase the pressure causing the heart to have to work harder. So you can prevent hypertension by taking meds as prescribed by your doctor, just like we talk about taking your diabetes meds correctly. You want to make sure you do that with your uh, blood pressure medications as well. Losing weight will help with your blood pressure. Stopping smoking will help with your blood pressure. Um, lowering sodium in your diet can help. And also regular physical activity, which we're talking about today, and limiting your alcohol intake. Um, hyperlipidemia is another risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, we already talked about the HDL being the healthy cholesterol that we want high and the LDL that we want to be low. And you should be checking your lipids. This is your lipid panel your doctor might check once a year. Um, and you can improve that by lowering your fat intake by 30%. Um, of your total calories, reducing overall saturated fat, and keeping cholesterol intake to less than 300 milligrams, and again, losing weight. Um, impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose increases risk for cardiovascular disease as well, and obesity increases risk by increasing bad cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels. But most of all, sedentary lifestyle, just not moving. So we got to get moving. Next here, we have a little cartoon. It says, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead for 24 hours a day? So not really funny, but it's a cartoon, but it's kind of something we think about as well. I often ask my patients when they say they just don't have time to exercise. My first question is, how much time do you spend on your phone scanning around on social media, news? different outlets, apps, playing games? Was there time at all in the day with that, that we could have done some activity instead, or maybe with it? There's some things that on your phone while you're doing it, you could do with it. And most of the time they're like, yeah, I just didn't choose to do it. But exercise is the golden key that's gonna help with so many of the conditions you're trying to help with, your heart, your diabetes. So. First of all, there are some conditions that would warrant being, you know, cautious about what activities you do start. So talking with your doctor prior to beginning your new regimen is recommended. So conditions like arthritis, osteoarthritis, back pain, neuropathy, Charcot's foot, and retinopathy, just to name a few. But just like your Cecilia health coach tells you, a minimum of once a year annual monofilament tests are recommended for your feet. So that's in regards to that neuropathy, especially. Um, you wanna make sure your feet are really healthy and that they're prepared to take on new activity 
especially in safe shoes. I've got folks who would just go out there, guns blazing, and gosh, I love it that they're super motivated, but they'll come back with blisters and areas that they didn't know that maybe didn't have as much sensation and then they can be numb and maybe it just wasn't proper shoes for the activity they were going to do or maybe they're not the right size so you really have to make sure you've got the right shoes you've got sensation in the areas that are important sometimes you might need um, shoe inserts or certain kinds of socks or something with moisture to help if your feet have a lot of moisture so Talk with your doctor, make sure you're getting those foot checks once a year with the monofilament and that your feet are ready to get those steps in. So take home messages right now. So not exercising is like, or being sedentary is kind of like smoking. It's, it's just as bad as smoking. If you don't exercise, it's the same risk if you're not a smoker. So we want to and if you are a smoker and not exercising, that's compiling and even more of a danger for diabetes and heart disease. So we wanna start moving more and start exercise today. So I have patients a lot tell me, well, you know, I walk from my car to the, to the grocery store. I park the farthest in the parking lot and I get a, a longer walk in. And you know what? That is awesome. You just got more steps in. I, I love hearing that. So here, here's the difference. So there is a difference between exercise and physical activity. Physical activity is movement that is carried out by the skeletal muscles that requires energy. In other words, just any movement you do is physical activity. Exercise is planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movement intended to improve or maintain physical fitness. So yes, there is a little bit of a fade between the two because we, we can see like on a Venn diagram, there's probably like a fade that kind of doing both. But if you're just saying my activity is the going up and down the stairs that you've got with your laundry at home, or I walked at work to the water fountain three times today versus just having the bottle at my desk, that's not a planned structured activity as much as getting your heart rate up with like say a small walk or a swim or um, go, going to the gym and lifting weights for a certain amount of time. So there is a little overlap, but we wanna make sure you have that structured activity. And here is the actual recommendation. And I've just had a patient today tell me her doctor told her this exactly so we're still on the same page with physicians too and and what uh, evidence shows us so all adults should achieve at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular work per week so you could do it at different intensities as well so it could be 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity five days a week or it could be 20 to 60 minutes of vigorous intensity intensity three days a week and it's okay to do short like shorter bouts of it as well going out tonight if you're not used to exercising and doing 45 minutes at a moderate pace might not be something your body is prepared for so maybe you're going to go out and do 20 minutes tonight just to get it started and that's okay so Adults should also do resistance exercises. So this is a little different. There's resistance exercise and there's cardiovascular exercise as well. Resistance exercise is best for adults previously sedentary or older adults as well. So these are where we're gonna be lifting some weights, having different pressure against our muscles. Um, and just, this is not on the slide, but this could be in weights. It could be in um, objects that you choose that are just maybe not weights like at a gym, but I have folks who use water bottles as weights or exercise bands or balls that are weighted. So there's lots of ways that you can incorporate resistance or just your own body. You know, when you're doing um, a, a push up, there's not a weight there that you're lifting, but you're pushing your own weight up. So that is a resistance exercise too. So there's different ways to think about resistance and how it's impactful. So if you do eight to 12 reps, it's for power. If it's 10 to 15 reps, it's for strength. 15 to 20 reps is for endurance and two to four sets for strength and power. 
And I, I have folks a lot of times, like I told you earlier with one of the excuses of, I don't know what to do. That is something commonly that I hear when people go to the gym for the first time. There, there's so many pieces of equipment there and some of them you just don't know how to use it. And what I would suggest is when you go to a gym first, if you join it, a lot of times they'll offer like a visit with one of the employees or trainers that can show you all around the gym and show you how things work. So that's one thing. And then at some gyms, they'll have pictures on the equipment that show you what to do. Um, if you see an experienced lifter or someone that you know has sound advice, make sure it's someone who knows what they're doing, that they can help to, to tell you like in this a piece of equipment particularly this is how many reps you would do and you would do it fast or slow or etc it's going to be different for everyone but definitely look for guidance with the employees and what your plan might already include going there and have extra help there if, if you can and then now we're going to talk a little bit um, about how it improves your blood glucose and losing weight as well so if you're going five times a week, 20 to 30 minutes, that's going to show an improvement in your blood glucose. And to lose weight, you're going to be trying to go five to seven times per week for 45 to 60 minutes. And you can, like we said earlier, you can divide the time into like 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, make it 20 minutes a day. You can split it up. I get the question a lot of when's the best time of day to exercise. I always say whenever you get it in. Everybody has different circadian rhythms, what they feel feels comfortable for exercise, when they feel most motivated, and when they just know they're going to get it in. So like I like getting in exercise in the morning because I like to get it over with. If I wait till the end of the day, then things get in the way and I feel like I don't, I'm just not going to do it. But some people in the morning, the last thing they feel motivated to do is go out and start using off that energy. So you have to figure out what works for you. And that's what works for you is the best for you. So now overall, we want exercise to lower blood glucose, but be aware, unplanned activity or activity without possible medication adjustment or food adjustment could lead to low blood sugars or hypoglycemia. So there are two main reasons exercise could cause low blood glucose too much insulin in the bloodstream and not enough carbohydrates to meet the needs of your body during the activity. So also depending on the intensity or even maybe the length of your activity, you may need additional fuel from carbohydrates during your activity. And your body may need additional carbs like, for instance, yogurt, fruit, crackers, you know, to rebuild the glucose stores in your liver and muscles. And we'll talk more about carbs in a few minutes. So I'm going to go into detail more about that. But it's about bal a balancing act between your medications, exercise, and the amount of stored carbohydrates or carbohydrates that you eat. And it's important to note that the risk of low blood glucose primarily applies to those taking insulin or certain oral medications that cause the pancreas to secrete more insulin, such as sulfonylureas, and that's like glipizide, glimepiride. Um, if you are unsure how your medication works, then talk to your healthcare provider or talk to your Cecilia Health educator. We can help you and tell you yes or no if it's something that we think is going to be something you need to um, be a little bit more leery of before your activity. So first, Remember too that when you lose weight, you are more sensitive to medication and a low blood glucose result. So how do you know if you're having a low, low blood glucose? Well, a low blood glucose is less than 70. You may feel shaky, dizzy, nervous, um, hungry. You might feel cl like clumsy. So it's very important that you test your blood glucose whenever you feel any of these symptoms. You don't want to guess how low your blood glucose is. I think that's one of the big things I talk with my patients is when you, if when in doubt, get your meter out. If you're not feeling right, we need to see what's going on. Um, if you ha are having low blood glucose episodes, this is important that you troubleshoot when it's happening before, during, or after your, your workouts. Um, all right. 
So what are the symptoms? So and treating your low blood glucose, I'm sorry there. If you do experience low blood glucose, here's what to do and to remember that a low, that how to treat your low blood glucose. So remember it's less than 70. So you want to immediately eat 15 grams of carbohydrates. So it could be eating or drinking, but 15 grams of carbohydrates and then recheck your sugar 15 minutes later. This is also called the rule of 15, okay? You check your sugar, it's less than 70. You eat or drink 15 grams of carbs, wait 15 minutes and check it again. Now, if your blood sugar is less than 50, again, if it's less than 50, you would have 30 grams of carbohydrates, wait 15 minutes and check your sugar again. If in 15 minutes, it's not back to normal, you repeat the process again. Wherever it's at, at the low level, if it's less than 50 or less than 70, either have the 30 or the 15 grams of carbs and recheck it. Now notice the 15 grams of carbs listed here are in glucose tablet form, fruit juice, dried fruit. It's also, you could do regular pop, you could do candies like jelly beans, like my kiddos, um, the jelly belly beans have one gram per bean. So I have them little 15 jelly bean bags ready to go if they need them. Um, so have that 15 minutes later. Now you don't want to have a snack that has protein and fat in it with it. So if someone says, well, I just went and had a glass of milk. Well, that will have an effect but it's not gonna have the effect that we want as quickly as we want because there's also protein and maybe fat in the milk. Same as if you told me, oh, I went ahead and have some peanut butter and crackers. Yes, that will probably raise it some, but not at the rate and the way that we want to raise it. So stick with things that have just straight sugars, just carbs to treat it. So a low blood glucose can be frustrating you, your apps, I know that you're, some of you are saying that right now, and we wanna try to help you plan ahead to prevent the low blood glucose from happening. So one way is that you can kind of start with it is to first kind of keep a record of what happens with your blood sugars before and during your workout and afterwards. So if you're on insulin or pills, you definitely want to Talk with your doctor if you're finding that when you work out, you're having these lows happen. There may be something they might wanna adjust. Um, or you, it just might be something that you just have a snack before you work out. So many of you with your diabetes educators, you talk about snacks and what's good for a snack. Um, a, anywhere from about 15 grams, which is a typical snack of carbohydrates, up to 30 grams, depends on how low you become during your workout, um, can, can help to deter you from having the low. Um, oftentimes, the combination of a carb and a protein is something you wanna look at too. So maybe that's when you wanna have a couple peanut butter and crackers before you start your workout. So you'll get a little bit of carbs, a little bit of protein as well. Um, if you start experiencing the low during the workout, go ahead and, and have a snack then. If it's maybe not low yet, but you feel like it's coming on, go ahead and have a snack while you're amidst the workout. So what is a low post-exercise? So if, if you guys hope you can see this here. So before exercise, if you're on insulin, is 110 to 140 and above 90 for pills. After exercise, you want it to be more than 90. With oral medications, insulin, you want it to be higher than 110 and children 120 to 130. I'm sorry, here we went through a couple quickly there. All right, so managing blood glucose. So we want to reduce your chance of having low blood glucose after exercise as well. So blood glucose can be lowered many hours after you exercise. For this reason, it's a good idea to have carbs and your meter nearby. Higher intensity activities can lower your blood glucose faster and for longer 
and how long you were active also needs to be considered. So as we mentioned before, monitoring your blood glucose before and after activity will help you learn the effects of activity on your blood glucose control. And it's important because every person's response to activity is totally different. So you might want to monitor your blood sugar even maybe before you go to bed, depends on when you've exercised during the day. So here's another cartoon here. I was hoping you let me know how much more insulin I need to take if I decide to supersize my order. <laughs> so it is a good idea to know ahead of time what the, you know, how much medication you take for food, how much you take for food if you're planning on doing activity afterwards as well. So an exercise alone is not the cure-all. A bad diet can negate the positive changes that you make. So this is just showing, you know, a burger here on the on the screen with onion rings and you know some folks are saying I exercise all the time I'm not losing the weight my blood sugars aren't getting better but it does take the combination of of exercise and diet so diet is the weight loser physical activity is the weight maintainer so here it shows you 3500 calories is a pound the easy way to think of it, you need a deficit of 500 calories over the course of seven days. If you split that up between diet and exercise, there's your pound weight loss that you're looking for. It's not always just cut and dry quite like that for everyone, but it is the standard and the, the value that we know for one pound. We also know that weight can fluctuate with fluids, um, bathroom habits, male versus female, the types of exercises we're doing. And there, there's a lot of factors that are factors in weight loss in general. So I know that can be discouraging for some just not getting the results as quickly as you want. So this is also a chart showing the effect on 160 male policemen. So there's on the top, it shows you how many weeks they were on a diet and the weight loss they had. So you see here that the policemen that had exercise and diet, I don't think you can see my cursor there, but the, the solid line was with exercise and diet. So you see they lost more weight having the combination of the two. And with no exercise, yes, they still lost weight, but not at the same rate. And it also, we don't know if it was maintained, but it definitely wasn't as much as doing diet and exercise together. But look, looking a little further, eight months, you see how the folks who didn't exercise started to gain their weight back while the people who exercised did maintain. And again, they continued to gain weight without exercising. All right, that went out all the way. <laughs> Oftentimes insulin will need to be adjusted. Um, generally, these are the recommendations, not always. So don't do this just because we're going over this today. Okay, again, don't make these changes until you talk with your doctor. Um, Humalog, regular insulin, Novolog, um, they'll reduce it two to one. The MPH insulin or 70-30 will also be cut four to two, so in half. Um, and Lantus and Levomir are rarely adjusted except for all day activity. So um, these are just showing that oftentimes these are adjustments that are made for, for insulin. So snacking, if you're going to plan on doing 30 minutes of activity, you might want to have that 15 to 30 grams of carbs. If it's going to be an hour of activity, um, you, know, you want to have 15 to 30 grams of carbs, but make sure you also have the protein component with it. And if you're doing 60 minutes of activity or more, uh, 15 to 30 grams of carbs, adjust the insulin potentially and have the protein as well. So which should you do? Um, Insulin, you want to make sure you plan activity. You might have to adjust the insulin. Um, if you're trying to lose weight to, or to maintain it, think about what your goals are and look at your blood sugars before, during, and after your workouts to know best how to make changes with your medication plan. And make sure you plan accordingly with your snacks. Um, not being, not having 
planned ahead of time, you could have that low blood glucose that we are not looking to have. Um, a lot of gyms will have bars and drinks available on hand, but um, this is not on this slide and I don't think we've added it before, but I know a lot of to have those bracelets that they wear that show they have diabetes. Um, and it's a good idea if something happens. I always look at folks who have them on. I've had an emergency situation at a gym that they had their diabetes bracelet on. I saw it. Then I also saw they had a glucose monitor on their stomach. So I knew it was something serious. So we took action quickly and they were fine. It was just a sudden drop in their blood sugar. So make sure you have a snack to prepare ahead of time and know what duration and you know intensity your exercise is going to be. And there are some situations where you aren't going to exercise or it's not recommended. If you have a sick day or your respiratory system is impacted, you got a head cold, um, proceed with caution if your blood sugars are over 250. Um, sometimes your doctor is going to want you to check for ketones. Um, if you don't, they might say it's fine to go ahead. Um, but specifically, if it's over 400, you're not going to want to. If you've got type 1 diabetes, if it's over 300, you're going to check your blood sugar five to 10 minutes after you're exercising. And if it's not dropping, then you're going to want to stop. Also, if you're type one, you're going to always check for ketones when your blood sugar is over 250. And if you got ketones, then you're going to want to stop. So there are some situations where we don't want you to go into diabetic ketoacidosis or um, make the situation even worse with it being as high as it is. What to bring with you when you exercise, you know, being prepared would also improve the success for you for building and maintaining that active, healthy lifestyle. And I recommend that you have these items all ready to go and that you are not rushing out the door. Uh, most people have like the ID bracelet. I knew that might be somewhere here. Um, the necklaces are also something you could wear. Um, your phone, it's usually on your pocket, on your hip, but that's something to have. Pack a small pouch with your meter and a carb source um, like your glucose tablets or some raisins, grab your water bottle, and definitely a good pair of shoes too. Don't want to have those shoes that's going to rub anything the wrong way. Next, setting SMART goals. A lot of you, when I talk with patients, I, tell, I ask you, is it, are we setting a SMART goal? And what we mean by that is it's an acronym for is it specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time bound. Those are what these stand for. And you want to set goals that you know you can build on to. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, I set one with a patient this morning who does no activity. So she's going to start walking specific. That's her activity. She's going to walk outside more specifically. Um, she's going to walk for 10 minutes a day for three days this week. And every week she's gonna add another day till she gets to seven days a week at 10 minutes every day. After she reaches that, she will increase it to 15 minutes a day for five days and then increase that until it's tolerated every day. So she's gonna work her way up eventually to 30 minutes at least five days a week, that's her goal. Is it attainable? Absolutely. She's starting small, 10 minutes a day, three days a week this week, and she's building on that. Is it relevant? Absolutely. It's a good exercise. It's a somewhere to start. And we realize that out the gate, it's something that her body can get adjusted to well. And is it time bound? Yes. We know we're going to build it up to the 30 minutes, five days a week. I should say as well, she wants to achieve this goal within three months. So you can be very specific, you know, and say, I'm just going to start going to the gym three days a week. That's, that's something you can say. Is that something doable? Probably so. Um, you, you need to find a gym. Is it something that's affordable for you? Is it something that, are there things with work or family that's going to get in the way? Make sure you make plans that are going to work with that. There's a lot of gyms that will have childcare now, which is really nice, and um, accommodate different schedules, 24-hour fitness, open all the time, or um, there's a lot of things that they try to help so that the excuses don't get in the way as well. So make sure you're very specific with what your goals are. And sometimes going into a gym like this 
can be really intimidating and you don't even have to go to a gym. That doesn't have to be where you go. You could have your gym right in your home. You could actually, I don't know if you've seen them, but you can buy resistance bands online. They're very cheap, um, like $10. Um, you can get them at Walmart as well with different weight resistances. You can slap them over your door, shut the door and do pulls and put, you know, pull-ups with the bands and there's a set that I bought a couple years ago with a weight loss class that had a DVD that came with it that showed how to do different exercises. Also YouTube is at our disposal as well so if you've got exercise bands or weights at home you can watch YouTube videos that show you different things that you can do or buy DVDs or um, rent things. There's different in the morning, I'm up really early. There's shows on TV that show different exercises you can follow. So you don't have to go to a big gym to get the workout you need. You can do it right at your home. It's just about doing it. And the elevator to success is out of order. You'll have to use the stairs one step at a time. And it really is true. One step at a time. If you haven't been exercising that's the past. Today's a new day. It's spring for a lot of folks. I work with patients mainly in Wisconsin and Chicago, and a month ago it was snowing. So anytime I hear, you know, well, the, when the weather gets better, I tell them, we know the weather's not going to be good over 50% of the year. What's plan B? That plan B might be in the home, in the gym, going to your local Lowe's, Target, Walmart, walk around. It's using a piece of equipment that might be something you hang clothes on right now. I get that a lot from patients. It could be an elliptical or a bike that you have at home. But it's just one step. Just start tonight. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Another thing I want to suggest is connecting something fun with it. So if you're not watching something entertaining or talking with someone in your family or a friend or listening to a podcast or music, you want to make sure it's something that entices you or something that brings you joy with the exercise. That will help to instill this as a routine that you enjoy doing. OK, so connect joy with it. Take it one step at a time. Build it. Build your goals little by little. OK, so I'm going to look over here at questions and I got a question right out the gate and go ahead over here. If you've got a question, ask it. I can see them here below. I do need to expand it a little bit so I can see all of them. All right. So one is do you have a recommendation for exercises on YouTube. So there there are so many. If you just specifically you on YouTube search like exercise band for beginners, you're going to get a lot of of people that that are great exercises. So one is um Leslie Sansone, she is one for walking at home doing at home walking exercises. When I was young, my mom actually had her VHS tapes, so I remember her as like a young kid, but she's on there now. There's, she has millions of followers. She has exercises that are for folks who have like knee issues, back issues. She has walks that are 10 minutes, 30 minutes, resistance, no resistance. So Leslie Sansone is one I know of. Um, another one is um, Mad Fit is another one. But if you look up like dumbbell exercises for beginners or five pound weight loss exercises, you're going to get a lot of videos. Some might be very professional. So look at like how many views they have. But that, that's a great place to start if you're doing things at home. OK, I have another question here. Um, my my blood sugars sometimes go up with exercise. Why is that? You know, you're, you're actually right. So like a lot of things with diabetes, sometimes blood sugars don't do what we might expect them to do. A lot of you say that too with like what you eat. Like I thought it was going to be higher than that. It didn't go as high or I thought drinking that as a, at that special occasion was going to do this and it didn't. So some workouts, um, such as like a heavy lifting workout or uh, like weight lift, like weights, um, sprints, 
or like competitive sports, they can actually cause you to produce um, stress hormones like adrenaline, cortisol is another one. Um, and adrenaline raises blood glucose levels by stimulating your liver to release sugar. So, you know, your liver does store glucose as well. So this can happen for some people. And you may find that when you check your sugar before and during your exercise that you don't need the snack before. Maybe that's just your unique situation. Like, you know, going into it, my sugar's fine. It always goes up. I'm good. Um, I still think it's a good idea to have a snack just in case you do need one. But um, yeah, that's a good question because it does happen for some folks that um, it does go up, surprisingly. Yeah. Good question though. All right, and one more. Do you recommend working with a physical trainer at the gym? Of course, I, I say go ask advice where you know folks have, you know, um, expertise in. I would warn you that you don't necessarily take advice about your diabetes or nutrition necessarily from just a physical activity professional because they might have had some training in some basic nutrition and they may be very wise on different macronutrients talking about protein and carbs and fat and how much you should have but they're not the expert in diabetes management so just because they have like nutritionists maybe after their name, that is not a dietitian. That could have been a two hour course they took online that they took a test and they could put that on their name. That does not mean that they have clinical evidence or expertise to tell you anything. So I would warn you from that. But as far as them sharing with you how to use equipment, how many reps to do, um, and around the gym, go for it. I think that's great. And we want to make sure you're using the equipment the right way. I actually told my son at the gym last week, he was, he was doing like some curls of some sort. And he was doing them really fast, like super fast. And this guy beside him said, you know, man, if you just do like eight of those and do them slowly, you're going to get more of an impact on the muscles that you're trying to target. And he was totally right. If you do things slow with this particular exercise, it was a lot harder. So, you know, that's just something a guy that had a lot of experience shared with him. And it was really nice. And my son changed his habit. So, <laughs> well, those were good questions. Gosh, I enjoyed our time today. And if you have more questions after we get off of the call today, just ask your coach, your Cecilia Health Coach. We love to speak with you more. I know some of the um, studies are kind of hard to see, and I had to click through the police one a little bit quickly there. But it did it does show that when you do exercise and and nutrition together, it does show more longer results for diabetes management and for weight loss in particular for that study. So I've enjoyed having you today. There's going to be another um, webinar June the 12th at 5.30, Mythbusters Separating Fact from Fiction, Finally Diabetes Unveiled. That's going to be a great one too. And check us out for more events. Ask your, your coach when the next one is. We love having you here. And this was a great time tonight with you guys. Thanks for the questions. Have a good night.